Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 11b of Useful Genetics. So this is the first of two lectures where we're going to be talking about mitochondrial genetics. In this lecture we'll talk about what mitochondria are and we'll use a description of their evolutionary history to make sense of why mitochondria have DNA and why our chromosomes have so many genes that came from mitochondria. We can think about what mitochondria are from different perspectives. First, structurally, what they are is membrane-bound organelles within our cells. So if that's a cell, and there's its nucleus, the cell's bound by a membrane, so is the nucleus, there are a number of structures within our cells that are also surrounded by membranes. One category of those structures are the mitochondria. Functionally, well, we can describe them by what they do. Mitochondria, and I'll color the mitochondria, actually I'll make them red. Mitochondria are the energy factories in our cells. They contain the proteins that generate cellular energy molecules, mostly in the form of ATP. You'll have heard of ATP. Um, and they do this by combining the breakdown products of food, particularly breakdown products of sugar, with oxygen. So they generate energy for all the cells in our body. Evolutionarily, mitochondria are shrunken, simplified forms of bacteria. Bacteria that live and replicate within our cells. And because that's what they do, they're called endosymbiont. Symbiont because there's symbiotic relationship with us. They live with us and help us. And endo because they're inside our cells. They're not like most of, for instance, our microbiome, which is bacteria that live outside our cells on the surfaces, particularly in our gut and on the surfaces of our skin. Genetically, mitochondria are DNA molecules. Well, there's contain DNA molecules. So I'll draw little circles to indicate that each mitochondrion contains at least one and usually several DNA molecules. And these DNA molecules are inherited every time the mitochondria replicate. So the mitochondria replicate by cell division, by division, in the same way that bacteria do. And when they replicate, their daughter cells inherit their DNA molecules. And these DNA molecules encode a few proteins of the proteins that are needed for mitochondrial function. And I'll show you where the rest of the proteins come from in a minute. So a typical human cell, this is just a schematic of a cell generally, a typical human cell has about 100 mitochondria. Of course, it depends a lot on the function of the cell. Cells that need to use a lot of energy, to produce a lot of energy, have a lot of mitochondria. Um, this picture only shows two. And there's about 500 molecules of mitochondrial DNA per 100 mitochondria. So each of these mitochondria might have five little molecules of mitochondrial DNA. I'm drawing the mitochondrial DNA as circles because that's what it is. Mitochondrial DNA isn't linear molecules, it's circular molecules like the genomes of bacteria. Here's um, some illustrations. This is a micrograph, a fluorescent micrograph of dividing human cells. These are melanoma cells growing in culture. And the blue is the human DNA. All of the red bits are the mitochondria in the cell as it divides. And you can see there are probably hundreds of them. And they're going into both of the daughter cells. You can see a lot of them in here, in the last space where the cells are still connected. Here's a different picture. In this picture, all you're seeing is the mitochondria. You're not seeing any other components of the cell. So just to clarify, this is probably where the cell's nucleus is, this gap where there's no mitochondria, because mitochondria aren't in the nucleus, they're in the cytoplasm. And then the boundary of the cell probably extends 
like this. Again, this might be a cell in culture that's spread out on the surface of a tissue culture dish. And you, but you can see the masses of mitochondria inside the cell. So we've said that evolutionarily, mitochondria are reduced, that is, shrunken, smaller forms of bacterial endosymbionts, bacteria that live and replicate within our cells. How did this come about? Well, I'll describe it and then I'll illustrate it with a couple of pictures. Many eukaryote organisms, that's organisms with nuclei, have endosymbiotic bacteria that live in some of their cells, as well as, as I said, the bacteria that live on the surfaces of all living things. And these bacteria perform all kinds of metabolic functions for the cells they're living in, but they're also, in some sense, a exploiter. They're using resources from the cell, and they're providing benefits. In an early ancestor cell, so more than a billion years ago, one such endosymbiont became domesticated. It became a essential and welcome part of the cell. And in particular, it became essential for energy metabolism. Since then, this proto-mitochondrion, which would have been at the beginning, very much like a typical bacterium with a chromosome that might have had several thousand genes on it, um, has gradually lost almost all the genes from its DNA, partly because a lot of these genes it just didn't need in its new environment, and others because they became integrated into the host cell's chromosomes, and now these chromosomes were providing that genetic information. So here's the diagrams. So parasitic bacterium living inside a cell. Initially, as a parasite, it's exploiting the cell's resources. Many bacteria still do that today. For instance, the salmonella bacterium that often gives you food poisoning. Um, in this eukaryotic cell, the parasitic bacterium multiplied and perhaps produced some benefits for the cell, as well as exploiting the nutrients that are in the cytoplasm. Now, over a billion years of coevolution, what's happened is that mitochondria are now essential for our energy metabolism and that of all plants and animals almost. And our cells contain modified, reduced forms of mitochondria that are, we see as organelles now, they're membrane bound structures. They have their own DNA shown as these little circles. And this mitochondrial DNA retains some genes that are essential for the mitochondria to function in the cell. Or mitochondria still replicate like bacteria. They divide by splitting in two like bacteria. They don't do mitosis. And the daughter mitochondria inherit the mitochondrial DNA from their parent cell. We can't generate mitochondrial DNA from our own DNA and we can't generate mitochondria from our own cells. We only, our cells only have mitochondria because they inherited them from the parent cell. In our genome, many of the bacterial genes that used to be in the mitochondrial genome are now part of the, our own chromosomes. It's probably happened through initially through chance events where some mitochondria would die and their DNA might get into the nucleus and recombine with the chromosome. But gradually, the eukaryotic nucleus has taken over almost all the functions of the original bacterial chromosome. And only, as I said, a few genes are left in the mitochondrial DNA. But these are essential for its function, as are many of the genes that are now in the host genome. So many of these genes are also essential for the function of the mitochondria. They make proteins that are transported into the mitochondria and function there. Plant cells also, in addition to having mitochondria, underwent a second endosymbiotic event, this time with an alga, a photosynthetic bacteria, and 
That alga gave rise to the chloroplasts, that's these green organelles inside of plant cells. Chloroplasts also have their own tiny DNA molecules, and most of the chloroplast genes are now specified by the host plant chromosome. So the implications for the genetics of mitochondrial function in animals and in plants, um, most of the genes needed for the function of mitochondria are nuclear genes. They're in the chromosomes and they're inherited just like any other ordinary gene. But some of the genes needed for function of mitochondria or plastids such as chloroplasts are encoded by the DNA of the organelle. When the cell divides, the organelles and the DNA they contain just move with the cytoplasm. You saw that with that melanoma cell dividing. There's usually no mechanism, no mitosis type fibers that pushes or pulls the mitochondria into particular places within the dividing cell. It's just chance how many mitochondria each daughter cell is going to get. In this case, you can see that this daughter cell is going to get about twice as many mitochondria as this daughter cell, just by chance. That will be important when we think about the inheritance of defective mitochondria. So we've considered the evolutionary history of mitochondria, how the mitochondria came to have genes, and how these genes are inherited, both the genes that are still in the mitochondrial DNA and the many more genes that are in our own chromosomes. Coming up next, we're going to think about the genetics of mitochondria more explicitly, thinking about what happens when an individual inherits mutant mitochondrial DNA. I hope to see you there.